Star Wars 7x7 episode 2318. We've gone from Easter eggs in chapter 9 of The Mandalorian to actual eggs with some comic and some frightening results thanks to The Passenger. That's chapter 10 or also season 2, episode 2 of The Mandalorian. And this is a full spoiler briefing. Punch it! Hey Rebel Riser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy. And thank you so much for joining me for it. So, we have another extension of the Adventure of the Week, thinly connected with the notion of it being about searching for Mandalorians, and yet, it's also very compelling and very scary <laughs> at some points. And good fun overall. Plus, even though there isn't a bevy of Easter eggs the way there was in the previous episode, there are still little bits and pieces here and there that are very cool, and we will get to those for sure. But first, in brief for the episode, we have a cold open, if you will, a standalone sketch for all intents and purposes that picks up right where the last episode left off. And it's going to be really interesting to see if this trend continues, because it's certainly possible for that to be the case the way this episode ended. But we have the Mandalorian speeding along, and he gets trapped, clotheslined practically, by a couple of hunters. And the scene is super well done with him trying to maneuver with his jetpack to keep from going flying too far, and then having to dodge the wreckage of the speeder as it crashes and burns. And poor little baby Yoda rolling in the crash too. And so there's a confrontation and naturally the Mandalorian gets the best of them. Now, as for who these characters were and whether they have any particular significance, it seems like the answer to that is no. Like, they're not necessarily connected with the Bounty Hunters Guild or Moff Gideon or anything like that. There's no tracking fob that shows up. But also, in the audio description for the episode, they're just mentioned as hunters. They're not given names, they're not given any other specific information. And for the fact that I could listen to the audio description and find out more from that perspective, I want to say thanks to Brian Fontaine, who is a friend here in New Hampshire and a co-host of the Sixth Scale Scavengers podcast. Didn't trip over it that time. How about that? <laughs> and a patron of the show, a great supporter. So thank you, Brian, for letting me know that I could check that out. He saw that through the Boba Fett fan club Twitter account talking about the mentioning of Boba Fett's armor in the audio description from the previous episode. So yeah, good to know if you are really interested in getting geeky about some of this stuff, you might want to listen to the audio descriptions on Disney+, Plus because it may give you even more information than even the captions do. So anyway, the Mandalorian is able to make it back to Moss Isley carrying everything that he has to carry on his back and when he gets into the cantina yes he goes back into the famous cantina and Eve 99 who was voiced by Mark Hamill back in chapter 5 of the Mandalorian but doesn't speak this time so I guess Mark wasn't on board for this particular episode he finds Amy Sedaris in a corner booth playing Sabak with a character known as Dr. Mandible. Dr. Mandible is a giant ant, and this should be the clue right here, but it didn't occur to me until I saw the end credits and went, oh, duh, of course. Peyton Reed was the director of this particular episode. Peyton Reed, of course, the director of the Ant-Man movies. So it makes a lot of sense that a giant anthropomorphic ant would show up in this episode somewhere. And thankfully, Dr. Mandible, by sheer luck, so this is kind of, you know, God machine, too big to be a coincidence sort of stuff, but... We'll see. It turns out Dr. Mandible happens to know somebody who knows where there's a Mandalorian covert. What are the chances? It turns out that it is a character only known as Frog Lady, and only described as Frog Lady, who has the precious cargo and has to go on the risky journey. The journey is risky because her precious cargo is eggs. It's frog spawn, and they have to be delivered to an estuary, and 
to get to this estuary, she can't be on a ship that goes into hyperspace because the eggs will die if the ship jumps to hyperspace for some reason. And conveniently, not only is the estuary on this moon Trask in the Cole Ivan system, but it turns out also that that's where the Mandalorian covert has allegedly been spotted on this moon of Trask. And by the way, Trask in the Cole Ivan system, brand new mentions, not something that existed in canon previously or in Legends, at least according to Wikipedia so far. So there you go. That's the log line right there. The Mandalorian taking a passenger with precious cargo, her eggs, on a risky journey, which is going through sublight speed only to the moon Trask. And apparently sublight speed travel opens you up to the possibility of pirates and marauders and other bad things. Which, of course, is what happens when it turns out that it's X-Wings that show up instead. And one of those X-Wings happens to be piloted by Trapper Wolf. Yes, Dave Filoni's character from Chapter 6, The Prisoner, shows up again. And his partner is a new person entirely, Carson Teva, who is played by Paul Sung Hyung Lee. And he is not another director. I was thinking that maybe there was a possibility he would be a director of an episode or, you know, a director somehow involved elsewhere. And that's because in The Prisoner, the other two pilots were also directors of Mandalorian episodes. Of course, Rick Famuyiwa and Deborah Chow. Didn't work like that. No, he is an actor, a Canadian South Korean actor, though, and has appeared in a bunch of things. And they are looking for Imperial holdouts. The Mandalorian doesn't have his transponder on or something, and once he turns it on, they recognize his ship from being somewhere near that prisoner transport, Bothan 5, and so he decides to hightail it, which leads to a chase, and so we'll talk about that footage as well, which is remarkable and kinetic and just really well done. And they managed to get away from the X-Wings, but with serious consequences, the Razor Crest is damaged yet again and has a hole punched in the hull. And it looks like the cockpit has lost its atmospheric integrity also. So it crashes through the surface of this ice thing that they landed on, which according to Wikipedia, the planet that they landed on is Maldo Crace, which appeared previously in the very first episode of The Mandalorian. It is where we first met him, where he was picking up that Mithril character at the very beginning of this whole series. Now, I'm not sure where that information is sourced from. I went looking, they have it on Wikipedia, listed as that but I just I don't know where that came from but that's kind of interesting that if the Mandalorian was supposed to be going to Trask which is one system trailing from Tatooine trailing I guess from the arm of the galaxy and Maldo Crace was on the way then Maldo Crace happens to be near Tatooine as well and Tatooine is definitely far away from Mandalore it's like, you know, northeast quadrant versus southeast quadrant of the galactic map if you're looking at the galaxy from the top down. So it does suggest that the Bounty Hunters Guild actually has quite a large reach if they're sending people to Muldo Crace, for example, to find some of their quarry. Anyway, so they crash, and what I was going to mention about the you know, sequence there is that this, again, is a lot of stuff that we saw in the trailer for The Mandalorian and commercials. So we're wiping out a lot of things that we already know from a visual perspective about The Mandalorian. The chase scene with the X-Wings, the ship falling down into the canyon, the ship you know, damaged and landed and them walking through ice caverns together and the Mandalorian shooting at you know, what I had said at the time was multiple targets, which turns out it was right, but it was not any sort of Jedi temple situation or anything like that. It was much more frightening. And speaking of frightening, just even before we get to the ice spiders, the whole notion of the ship crashing and them being, you know, in a cavern by themselves with nobody there, no help, no way to call for help or anything like that, you really do get a sense of just how dangerous being out and about in the galaxy is. I mean, that whole time you're sitting there wondering, how are they going to get out of this? How is the Mandalorian going to get this fixed and be able to escape? It seems like it's in possible. It really does seem like that's the case. And it is rather interesting that the way that a lot of the Mandalorian's planets have been portrayed 
is very limited in population, right? So when he was at Sorgan, there were, you know, little settlements here and there, but mostly not very much. Tatooine, of course, very sparsely populated and very spread out. And Maldo Kreis, it seems like, is the same kind of situation, too. Navarro, we don't necessarily have a sense, but, you know, there is a town, but it's also surrounded by lava fields. Arvala 7, where the Mandalorian is, is also sparsely populated, too, and that's where Quill has gone to basically just drop off the map and live a quiet existence. So you really do get a sense of how big the galaxy is, and because of the fact that it isn't sparsely populated in places, particularly in the Outer Rim, just how dangerous it is if you aren't able to take care of yourself, how on your own you could find yourself and stranded and just out of luck. So while this is happening and to balance out the scary with the funny, Baby Yoda is eating the eggs of the frog lady, which is horrifying in a different way. You're like, oh, no, no, because if these eggs are gone, then the family line of frog lady and her husband on Trask is done. Like, that's the end of their line. There will not be any more of frog lady and frog husband and her family. That's just, that's it. That's one whole genetic line wiped out. And baby Yoda, who has no conception of this apparently, just knows that the eggs look very tasty and they are tasty enough that he keeps going after them. So it's like, oh, no, <laughs> it's really scary. And then it gets even crazy scarier because you get that ice cave where there's a hot spring and frog lady is relaxing and gets the eggs out to stay warm, which is nice. But then baby Yoda starts wandering around and you see these little things that are actually described initially as monoliths in the audio description, which I thought was kind of interesting. But once he scratches one open and you see it's an egg, if you have watched any of the alien movies whatsoever, your blood pressure probably went through the roof. And especially when he reached in and grabbed that thing and it had all the little like spiky claws and whatnot, I was like, oh, this is not going to end well. And it really doesn't. And I was reading an article that, if I remember right, I think it was Polygon that talked about how it just switches genres this episode does, where it starts off as a Western and it ends as a horror movie and, you know, probably comedic in between, if I remember right. But yeah, oh my gosh, this spider sequence, if you are arachnophobic at all, you will not want to watch this sequence. It was scary, crazy, scary. And so part of the answer of how are they going to get out of this comes when those two X-Wing pilots finally track down where the Razor Crest went and Trapper and Carson shoot all of the spiders and that, as they say, was that. They were going to arrest him, but it turns out that he is going to get a break because of the fact that they managed to capture three high-value targets from the Wanted Register. So the three characters that the Mandalorian left locked up on the New Republic transport. Turns out that that ends up paying off for the Mandalorian because it's what lets him walk out of the situation alive. But the two X-Wing pilots really kind of not nice, like don't offer to help him. Like, I guess they helped by killing all the spiders. So that's something like, oh, well, look a gift horse in the mouth. But I mean, his ship was downed and damaged and has a hole punched in it. And they're like, you know, like, how about we don't arrest you? And then, you know, you like watch yourself around here and we don't shoot you out of the sky again the next time we see you around here. And then they take off and like, well, gee, you know, they could just be leaving him to die for all they know. So they take off and the Mandalorian is able to repair the cockpit enough so that way they are sealed in and he tells Frog Lady to use the privy before the, he seals them in because it's going to be a long ride. This is something that I, you know, for some reason this is one that made my ears perk up because how they refer to restrooms or bathrooms in Star Wars is kind of fascinating. Privy is the, f this is the first time that a bathroom facility has been referred to as a privy in Star Wars, as far as I know. Freshers or refreshers or bathrooms or restrooms have also been mentioned too, but this is the first time that one has been referred to as a privy in Star Wars, to my knowledge. And so they manage to take off and Baby Yoda still has an egg squirreled away and manages to glop it in his mouth. And you're like, oh no, why? 
So we see at the end of the episode the Razor Crest flying away from probably Mondo Crace, maybe not Mondo Crace, and it is listing and the back bay door is open. And so that's something that we saw, obviously, at the very beginning of the trailer where we thought, ooh, something really bad happened to it. And something did, but it was probably not quite the bad thing that we thought might have happened. And speaking of that, all the scenes with the X-Wings and the chases in the caverns and whatnot and all that I stuff, yeah. All of that too. So we are really running out of stuff that we've already seen, which is kind of cool because that means we're really going to be surprised by what happens over the next six episodes. And there's one last fun fact I'm going to share with you in just a moment that ties into Dave Filoni and his work on Star Wars Rebels. But before I do that, just a quick note, public service announcement thing that I've been talking about for the first few days this month. Step away from the devices, step away from the computers, step away from the TV, step away from the news stories, get outside if you can and breathe. And just know that at this point, like they still haven't even called the presidential race by the time I'm recording this. So whatever they're going to say, whenever they're going to say it, it'll happen when they finally decide to say it. So I need this advice as much as anyone else. Stop refreshing your tabs, stop <laughs> closing and reopening your apps, just breathe and do whatever you can to go about your business and help the people around you and take a break with a daily dose of Star Wars joy from this show and, you know, other shows that you enjoy or whatever other hobbies you particularly enjoy. Go get a breather and relax because it's been a rather tense few days and it's good to reset so that way you can be ready for whatever happens next. So the fun fact from Star Wars Rebels that Dave Filoni seems to have inserted in here is that those spiders are called Krikna, K-R-Y-K-N-A, and they first appeared on the planet Atalon, which is where the Spectre Cell Rebels from Star Wars Rebels set up a hidden base, and those spiders were native to the planet. They had to put out sensor shields or something like that to you know keep them at bay and also help you know keep the base safe. It's not... Atalon, though, this planet, it's a different climate altogether, and that's when I found out it could, should be Maldo Crace, potentially, maybe. So, it would have been amazing if it had been Atalon, after all, but it apparently is not just because the climate f for the two planets is not the same. At least that's what I'm hearing and reading right now, but if that ends up getting changed or, you know, edited somehow, then I will absolutely let you know. But, for that, that is going to do it for this episode of the show and our briefing on The Passenger, which is Chapter 10 or Season 2, Episode 2 of The Mandalorian. Thank you so much for joining me for this one, as always. And may the Force be with you, wherever in the world you may be. Star Wars 7x7 is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited or their respective trademark and copyright holders. May the force be with them. All original content is copyright 2020 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.